So I'm Dennis Brown. I'm here today to talk about uh, zombies and how hackers kill them. Unfortunately, this isn't the kind of zombies that you kill with shotguns, which is fun, or the ones that involve people loving Twinkies, although I do. Um, it's about, ha about the badge game we had at a conference called Callhog Con, based in Rhode Island earlier this year, where we had a zombie game on our badges for the conference, the electronic badges. Let me uh, pull one up here, like this one here. If anyone can see that, probably not. Um, and we had a lot of good fun with it. We had a lot of good data as a result. I'm here to talk about that today, how we did this, what the data we collected was, what people did with the badges once they got their hands on them, the havoc they created, and uh, all the kinds of good stuff. So let's get into it. So what is Quahog Con? If you watch Family Guy, you uh, probably have heard of the city, Quahog, Rhode Island. It isn't a real city in Rhode Island, unfortunately, but it's like every city in Rhode Island if you know the place. Um, it's also the state clam. Yeah, we're strange there. Um, but it was a new conference this year, a uh, regional one. We had a great turnout, it was a lot of fun. We focused on having a lot of infosec tracks and having a lot of maker culture stuff too. We had a wonderful uh, hardware hacking area, the tool guys came to have a lockpick village. It was a blast, it was a lot like a really, really, really small version of DEF CON in some ways, so we had a great time. And I'm Dennis Brown, I helped organize Quahog Con. I also helped run the uh, DC 401 chapter. Anyone here from DC 401? Yeah, thanks for coming. That's all of you, I think. <laughs> and uh, my day job is I am a security researcher at a Tenable Network Security. I do a lot of malware research, or if I talk to anybody who knows Tenable at all, I write nasals because that's all anyone thinks. So Nessus plugins, that's all. Um, <laughs> A lot more than that, but so this was kind of out of my element for something—a project to work on. I haven't done a lot of things dealing with hardware. I've never written firmware ever before, so this was a fun project to get involved with. We had a great small team of people working on these badges diligently to really make them fun and usable, and it was a great project to work on. And our goal when we started working on this was have a badge that was hackable, something that you could just sit down, have fun right away, no barrier to entry or anything. And then something we wanted to use after the con was over so you could take it home, keep hacking on it, and maybe get something useful done with it. And, and there's actually some great useful things people have done with it after the con, which is awfully nice. Um, we want to include wireless connectivity on the badges because having an LED flash or something that is kind of passive is fun, but we wanted to have a little more interactivity with the badges uh, because that's just cool, right? Um, so we wanted to also put a game in there too because it's fun to have a badge that'll like like a TV be gone badge. That's fun. It's fun to cause trouble when you're in a bar with guys wanting to watch sports and you turn it off on them. But we want to have people have something active to do at the con. We can interact with everybody else there. So we uh, definitely, that was one of our main design goals when we started. We definitely wanted to have an open source development environment because it's no fun if you have to go and use proprietary tools or uh, IDE that you're not familiar with to get going on it. We uh, ended up using GCC, so that worked out really well for us. And uh, we want to make it easy to write custom firmware for. So I'd say out of the three, uh, out of the four points here, we only hit about three of them. The uh, ease of uh, development or getting people working on it at the con was a little bit of a misfire on our part. And I'll talk about that later when we uh, go over the mistakes we made. So the badge design itself was really great. It actually was done for us from the start. We worked with a company called Redwire LLC based out of Massachusetts. Uh, they had this product, they call it the Red Bee Econotag. That's the picture of it there on the projector. Um, it's a really nice device. It uses the uh, Freescale MC1322-4 um, microcontroller, which is an ARM7 microcontroller. It runs at something like 20-something uh, megahertz. I forget the exact number of megahertz, but it's a really nice chip. And the great thing about it, it has a lot of nice features. It has a nice watchdog timer to make it so you can keep it from crashing when some guy's sweaty shirt touches it and makes the whole badge freak out, which happened a few times. Um, it has an AES right on the chip, so you can have all kinds of nice encryption with it, which we totally did not use. But the feature we used it for was it had Zigbee on board us, 802.15.4. This was excellent. We, uh, this gave us pretty much everything we wanted in one package, and we started working with the Red Bee guys. They helped us expand upon it a bit to really make it what would be great for our conference. Another nice thing it had that we chose to keep was it had a USB connector on it, which made this a breeze to flash and write custom firmware for and just expand upon it however you wanted to. Uh, this worked out wonderfully for us. The picture on here is the end product we had. And if you notice, the middle of the badge is pretty much what we had with the econo tag from the previous slide. And I apologize for the uh, missing a few things on the slide there. Hopefully all the good data is there. But uh, we took the econo tag design. We changed a few things about it. Um, we ended up with the same interface they had with uh, two buttons and a reset button. The reset button is on the left. Um, we have we added five red LEDs on the left side, like a little bank of five, and a RGY, red, green, yellow RGBs on the right side, well, LEDs on the right side. And we made it use AA, or AAA batteries. 
which we thought was a good call because if people wanted to do something after the fact, they could just go to any pharmacy, any store and pick up some triple A's, pop them in the batch, and they're rolling once again with whatever they're doing with it. Um, ultimately, we, got, we worked with a local manufacturer, J&J Technologies, out of Foxborough, Massachusetts, which we love working with local fabricators for these. Um, we ended up with about th 30 bucks for badge, which we rolled into the cost of admission, which made this very affordable for us. The overall admission was $100, so this was right in our budget. It was great. We uh, just rolled it back to the attendees, and everybody seemed to enjoy that part of it, at least. So the badge was really easy to code for. Like I said earlier, it just uses an ARM cross-compiler. Uh, if you go to the uh, MC1322 development site run by the Redwire guys, um, they have all the tools in there to build the tool chain, get it all working just properly. Very, very easy to work with. Um, and there's a lot of fun things you can do with it even after the con when you're not playing with your follow con mates anymore. Uh, Josh Wright at Koha Con used uh, the Killer B uh, pr uh, tools he developed in order to attack other badges there and really make them freak out quite a bit, which was fun. He uh, gave him a few tips on things he should try, and he tried all of them and really made people freak out a bit at the conference. Um, there's Contiki support. Contiki is essentially a full uh, development, a uh, full system environment for the badge itself, which helps you, uh, which just abstracts away a lot of the things. It gives you IPv4 access, IPv6, using 6 low pan, a lot of other great utilities for it. It essentially is like running a full operating system on the badge in some ways. Um, there's a lot of sample code that worked really well that was distributed with the development tools for the badge, which people were using to right away write packet sniffers, uh, packet injectors with a whole lot of great tools. And just the other day, uh, Dragorn implemented Kismet support for the badge itself, which I'm going to demonstrate here, and I hope it still works. It's in the very alpha stage. But what this does is it turns the badge into a uh, Zigbee sniffer, so you could use this, or if you purchase the uh, Kano tag from the Redbee guys, go to your uh, next pen test with a con badge and try to find uh, Maybe if you're at a SCADA facility, use a ZigBee, find vulnerabilities there, walking around with your conference badge. So I thought that was pretty cool. So I want to demonstrate that here to show the kind of stuff we see. Now, one thing I asked for before this conference, if anybody's on, if anybody was reading on Twitter or on the DC4 mailing list or on the Koha Con site, to bring your badges. So now would be a good time to get them out and uh, generate some traffic for me to actually see with this. Just one second, I'll set this up. So I'll apologize if it isn't too easy to see, but okay. So if you can just, let's see if you can see anything here. So I'm starting some buttons here. If not, I'll fire something else up. So this is the Kismet server we're running right now. The uh, Zigbee, uh, the what is it? The D15.4. Uh, module is a new one in Kismet SVN. It was checked in last night, so I ch ch advise checking it out if you want to see it. It's nothing happening, I'm guessing. Live demo failure, I guess. Oh well. Um, but it was in there if you have something like this or any other device that uses uh, that does Zigbee, it, that uses the serial Zigbee drivers available for the this chipset and some other ones as well. Um, I was talking with Dragarn, who unfortunately couldn't be here this year. But uh, he said that he believes it'll work with the Ninja badges as well this year because they use the same microprocessor. So hopefully we can get some good stuff with this. Is this thing just failing? Absolutely. So supposedly these things have a 600 foot line of sight rates. Oh, thank you, Larry. Let's try it out. Oh, hold on. Let me try that. Okay, so this is absolutely failing. I'm sorry, it's really, really early alpha code. But uh, if you have one, you want to check it out. Just uh, check it out of the Kismet SVN repository. It uses the plugin architecture, which is pretty new in recent versions of Kismet. So if you haven't used it, uh, it's really just other modules you compile in, add them to your source directory, add them to your home directories, Kismet directory, Kismet slash plugins, and it loads right up and works fine. Except not right now when I want it to work, of course. So let's get away from that. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> so, so like I said earlier with the firmware, we wanted to have a game for it. And we wanted it to be something that attendees could do while they're sitting in talks, while they're t chatting with people, just to kind of pass the time, have some fun with, and then, of course, attack in any way they can see fit. So uh, we came up with a bunch of multiple, we had multiple design ideas. One, the one we got working first and actually had fully implemented in the firmware was a Tamagotchi game, which would have been incredibly lame. Um, this was about four weeks before the conference, so we were very worried that this wasn't going to pan out and we were going to be stuck with an incredibly lame firmware on the badge. Fortunately, that didn't happen. 
we uh, went through a few iterations, and then uh, as we were working on the design for it, we landed on the concept of a zombie versus humans game, where some people would be humans, some people would be zombies, depending on the firmware they got when they registered for the conference. And they would have instructions on how to attack the other side, or maybe become another side, or switch over to the other side. We implemented this in about three weeks, which is a awfully short amount of time to implement something for this scale, but uh, it was hacked together really poorly. It came out to be about 4,000 lines of code total for the various firmware versions we had, and uh, the code is absolutely atrocious, but it will be available on the KohaCon website um, if you want to check it out and criticize and laugh, so that is certainly something you're welcome to do. Um, next time we do this, we'd like to have more time to implement this. I'd recommend anybody who tries to do a project like this themselves, give yourself more time than a few weeks to do it. Um, so the way the game works, like I said before, humans like to kill zombies, which is how things work in nature. Um, they had multiple attack modes, so they could do stronger attacks, but they could take more damage if a zombie hits them, or they could be more defensive and not get hit as hard, or and not hit as hard. Um, zombies would kill humans using a charge-up style attack, where they'd hold down a button and have a more powerful attack the longer they wound up for it. And the speakers and vendors, we decided to give them something special uh, in the firmware without having a different badge for it by giving them, making them a cleric or a healer um, where they would heal humans and try to convert zombies back into humans. So this was just fun because we figured the, the speakers probably were just going to do their talk and meander about, maybe not sit around too much to play with it. And the vendors are probably too busy doing other things. So we gave them pretty powerful capabilities in this, for these badges here. And then the uh, security people, we call them the muscle there, named after another type of clam or shellfish. Um, where they would be able to attack anyone, but they had the weakest attacks possible because they were supposed to be working the whole time and we didn't want them having actual fun. We wanted them to actually work, so we put them uh, very weak. So I'm going to do a live demo here with some badges. I could use five volunteers actually to come and grab one and give it a shot. Um, yeah, just, just come up, just come up. I don't care. Over here. Over here. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's five. That's good. Oh, God. Wow, that's really <laughs> creepy. Thank you. <laughs> so grab one of the uh, badges here. You have a whole kit with some uh, AAA batteries. Please put the batteries in the right way. There's little marks on the inside of the battery thing. Which one's the plus? Yeah. And there's lanyards if you want to hook it up and uh, hold it somewhere. So. What a pleasing design. I know. The green circuit board design was uh, called How We Do This Very Cheaply. So. It worked out well for us in that regard. <laughs> so this is the exciting part we watch people put in batteries. <laughs> so once they have it in, it'll boot up right away and load up into a mode. Yeah, hold, hold yours up there. This would be a human badge, the one with the white, uh, the whole column of red LEDs lit there. That means they're not zombies, and they can use the bottom button to change the mode they're in, and the top button will then, depending on the setting they have it in, will send an attack packet out, and if another zombie in the area reaches or sees it, they're hurting and they're not so happy at that point. So, what do we have? What, what, can you hold your badges around to the front? Four humans, and if we all have humans, this is epic fail on my part. <laughs> <laughs> is that batteries in the wrong way? Or? These catch on fire. Yeah, they won't catch. They shouldn't catch on fire. So, to make this a little more compelling, I'm going to fire up one of our tools for this. Put this up there. So, we collected a lot of packets through the whole weekend. We had a, we had two uh, packet sniffers running in the various parts of the conference, and we captured a whole lot of data here. Probably have to reset that. So I'm going to run this here while people hit the button so you can see the actual Zigbee magic in the air. Is there magic in there? Yeah. There's magic in there. Okay, so we see on the screen here, I hope you can read it. They're coming up there. The QZ entries are all various packets going through. Um, the one denotes a human attack, two is zombie, three and four are cleric attacks, or heals, I guess they are technically. So this is what we saw all weekend long, just traffic like this flowing in and out. The rest of the columns here, after, so it's QZ just knows the type of packet it is, the type of attack, the third power is the strength of that attack, and then the rest of it is actually random data, so that's just garbage. Um, if you notice one thing here, where all the threes and fours always have a 20 after it, I'll be talking about that shortly. That was a terrible oversight on our part. But anyway, oh, so his badge is flashing in and out. That means he's a dead zombie, so you've lost. <laughs> I'm sorry, you've lost. 
but you can button mash and then come back to life. So zombies had a very nice feature in that regard. So this is fun, I have this demo, if everybody having fun seeing random text come up on the screen, I'm sure. Okay, well that's good. I think we can, you can just keep playing this whole time, have fun, kill other people. Yes. I like how you're button mashing. We'll be talking about that briefly. <laughs> so that's good. Thank you very much for your help. And you guys keep your badges. You can uh, have a little souvenir of the talk. Thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome. Yeah, just give yours away because you're a loser. Let's hear right now. Yeah, thank you for all the volunteers. Yeah. So hopefully that wasn't too uncompelling, but uh, that's pretty much what we saw all weekend. That was exactly what it was like being there. Not really. But. So, like I said, the attacks for the uh, humans and zombies did one to five damage, depending on the mode, depending on things. It actually went up to double that if they had certain other conditions. The uh, humans started out with 500 health, so they'd have to take, get hit 500 times, and they also had to have defense. They had other ways to defend themselves against it, too. So it took a while to kill somebody. Zombies had less health, but as I mentioned, if you button mashed on it, you could come back to life, so their health kind of didn't matter. Um, after uh, and the clerics, like I said, they healed 20... 20 health at a time, which was terrible. Um, this is an influence of me having played a lot of World of Warcraft back in the day where nobody wants to heal, so I figured nobody would want to heal at a conference either. There you go, that's my priest over there. Um, so this was kind of unfortunate. We should have made this much lower because there were actually people in the vendor area tweeting saying, hey, you low on health? Come over to our vendor booth and we'll, we'll heal you up. <laughs> Which is great advertisement. It's a way to get people to your booth, but uh, it kind of impacted the game where a lot of people didn't die like we wanted them to because I was definitely on the side of the zombies for this. So that was pretty interesting. And there was also another badge, which I don't have a demo of here, but it ran in god mode where I could turn people into any mode they wanted. Uh, me and one other person had the god mode badge because we didn't want that getting out too much. But in the end of the day, it ended up being a prize if you're able to hack your badge properly and uh, get to this mode. Um, this was really fun to play with, actually, because once I noticed the uh, healers were having a little too much fun healing and advertising on Twitter and getting really upset if uh, people were trying to attack them, where they would be physically running away from people, although that doesn't matter, guys, <laughs> unless you're really, really fast. Um, I had one point where I was intent on getting uh, Dan Kaminsky, who was very happy to be a healer and very upset if people were coming after him, uh, following him around trying to turn him into anything but a healer, but unfortunately didn't work, and there's reasons why. So when we rolled all this out, we made a few predictions. Okay, what are we going to see people doing with this? What's the kind of stuff they're going to want to do to really mess with us? Well, the first thing I figured, well, all the packets, we didn't, th those were unencrypted, but all our packets were encrypted. And we ch chose intentionally bad, quote unquote, encryption. So people would actually crack this and not really have the whole weekend spent saying, oh, I don't know what's going on, or just doing a simple replay attack or something like that. Uh, but we did expect that kind of stuff. We didn't expect, expect replay attacks, especially if they crack the encryption. We expect them to actually totally own the game, which a few people did. Um, we expected hardware hacks, people putting like a 555 timer hooked up to their uh, attacking button and just constantly auto-attacking the whole weekend long. We uh, didn't really want that to happen, but it was certainly a possibility at, to a point. And then we knew people would do things we never expected, and boy did we miss the mark on some of them. So on April 23rd, we opened up the con at 5 p.m., started distributing the badges. We went with the, uh, about 65% human badges distributed, 30% zombie, the rest for everybody else. And the first day went pretty much as planned. The humans, there were just so many of them, they didn't really care what was going on. They'd hit buttons, they wouldn't see anything happen. So they just said, oh, this is great, I'm going to go enjoy, have a drink, and see what's going on. The zombies saw things happening, and they were very excited because there were way more humans than there were zombies. So they went on the attack and really tried to get a foothold of more zombies in place than humans. So and I was certainly encouraging this to telling everybody who could attack as a zombie to definitely attack as a zombie because the humans needed to die. So, I mean, they did. So the first day, Friday night, really went as planned. It was a lot of fun. We'll see the data in just a moment here. But on the second day, as soon as people woke up and had some time to play with things, really strange things started happening in the data. Now, this graph here, I apologize if you can't quite see the top of it, is what we saw. The, uh, on the very left-hand side, you see, I apologize for if it's hard to read, but the very left-hand side, the big spike you see there are the zombies, and those are the people, like I was saying, get everybody, all the zombies need to attack. The humans were attacking a little bit. They were there, but they didn't attack anywhere near the volume of the zombies that they did. The next day, however, if you notice, all four colors on this graph spiked all the way to the top, and they did a little bit later on in the day, that evening, too. So I looked at this data when I first saw it, and I'm like, this is really strange. Why would we have all these attacks like that? 
So we had to go through the data, dig through and investigate, and I, we come up with a lot of interesting results, which I'll get to in a few slides here. Um, I already covered that. So one of the things we did see were hardware hacks. We saw a lot of neat uh, people trying to do things with a badge to affect the game directly, which I thought was great. Unfortunately, outside of uh, predicting that people were going to use like timers to automate their attacks, we didn't really provide any good ways to use the hardware to, to influence the game directly. And we actually wrote into the firmware a uh, uh, timeout so they wouldn't actually be able to automate their attacks because we didn't want people just flooding the network full of packets all weekend long. That was no good. That, that would really uh, be detrimental to the quality of service, so to speak. Um, so we rate limited all the attacks. Nobody was able to do anything about that. And some people tried, other people, this also prevented people from mashing the buttons like we saw one of the volunteers doing while he was up here, where it really didn't matter. You could only attack once every five seconds. And uh, so people had a lot of sore thumbs as a result for no good reason. Uh, the buttons were not very friendly on the thumbs. But this was great because it stopped many of the automated attacks we saw and everybody just, we didn't tell anyone so we had a lot of fun laughing at people the whole time. So there were some moderately successful attacks, depending on how you define success. Um, the, probably the most, Im the most impactful event that happened was one guy had a fuzzer. He just took some of the sample code we had, um, said, well, I'm just going to throw random junk out there. I know how big these packets are. I'm going to throw random data and see what happens. And uh, it wasn't entirely predicted by us. And we didn't really think someone was going to actually flood the network as much as they could the entire weekend long to essentially shut down the game in a few ways, which was quite unfortunate. Um, he made people's badges were changing modes right, really, and doing really strange things as a result, things we didn't really predict. And this essentially just turned into a giant denial of service attack on the conference for the entire weekend. Um, this, the badges just did not know how to handle this. We didn't do anything smart like check summing on the badges, so that was really a poor call on our part because every, every packet was essentially valid. And this really confused the attendees and myself for quite a bit. Um, we, so we collected about 30 megs of logs, which was the data you just saw on the screen there. So 30 megs of just those, what, 10 or so characters is a lot of data. Um, out of the attacks we saw, we saw 39,000 and change successful attacks. And this includes a fuzzed attacks and other auto automatically replayed attacks that were uh, of, the, of a valid type, but we didn't really differentiate them from, we couldn't differentiate them from what was actually fuzzed. And then we saw one and a half million fuzzed attacks. So the guy who, the people who are doing this kind of stuff, they were just firing out packets as fast as possible and really, really messing things up. Um, it was a lot of fun to see it afterwards in the data though. What we have in the screenshot there is an example of what they were doing. The uh, third column there is the actual attack type. The valid types were one through four and 99 for the God mode. Uh, none of these were valid. The, all the data here was clearly just being randomly generated. And this had just such a devastating effect on the badges. It was uh, fun to a point. <laughs> so. Fuzzing aside, people did similar things with packet replay, which was very successful. Uh, there were at least two people I know that were at the conference that actually figured everything out, started replaying, uh, started replaying packets, and just started impacting the game however they wanted. This was great if you want to have an automated attack. You just have to make a custom firmware, which was very easy to do with the samples. Start replaying a, a captured packet that you saw that you knew was a valid attack, and just go to town on it. And it worked really, really well for them. Uh, this got around the late rate, yeah, excuse me, the rate limiting uh, code we put in place because at this point it's your code. You, don't, you didn't really have to apply to ours at this point. Um, and some people actually did this with the to replaying by just generating a. Excuse me, just generating uh, some random data in there, but using the proper format and inferring what was going on by watching other packets. And they, they actually accessed the God mode packet these ways. Um, but they didn't really understand what was going on. They just were replaying what they saw and replaying it a bunch of times and seeing everybody's batch freak out. So the way that this got a lot better was when they cracked encryption. Now we use this very, very high tech thing called XOR. Um, <laughs> if we did this intentionally because we wanted to make it fun, um, it, if the one line there is just a sample of what a packet looked like raw. The uh, first byte there, actually the second, the second byte in this line, um, is the XOR key itself. So every packet that went out, we had the key in it. So this made it pretty easy to figure out what was going on. And then the second and third bytes there were the packet type and the, uh, the power of the attack, or just looking at the other parameters to pass through for the function. And the rest of it, like I said earlier, was junk. Once people started cracking this, the whole game opened up. Everybody just started seeing, okay, what can I send through now? What'll work? I know I can send valid packets of any type I want. Let's see what happens. And uh, this is where people started having a whole lot of fun. Um, another way people did have some really good luck was by brute forcing as well. 
Uh, especially once the incursion was broken, they, we were seeing people just going through, trying everything they could to figure out what was going on. And they essentially mapped out the entire protocol this way, uh, especially if they were in closed quarters without a lot, not a lot of other people around. They could see the direct actions of what they were doing on other people's badges. So that was a lot of fun. Um, we had a, a, excuse me. So we had a few obvious attempts of what was going on here. I'll show that right here. This was clearly one person or maybe multiple people, I'm not exactly sure because we just collected the data randomly. Um, collecting or just trying anything they could, they started replaying the same numbers through the different power fields here. Um, this may have had an effect if they weren't using zero as the packet type that was not that was an unused value. So this was pretty interesting where people are just firing away at crazy trying to see what they could make it do. And then someone smartened up here and said, it's probably awfully hard to read, but they just went through and iterated through every kind of packet there was to see what would happen. Trying it first in the packet type column, which they didn't know at the time with us. They just tried one column at a time. Then again at the packet power column. Um, this was really smart. This actually was pretty close to actually breaking the entire protocol for the game and figuring out what was going on. Uh, except for the part that having zero as the other value would essentially make all the attacks be of zero power, which obviously won't hurt anything. Oh, and then like I said in the slide previous, the attack type of zero, so that didn't do anything either. So whoever this was was just a hair away from cracking everything that was going on, and but just didn't quite have it. So unfortunate for him. Um, but this is definitely the way that people were going through and thinking about how to attack this, trying to crack what was going on in these packets, figure out what was going on. And uh, ultimately people were figuring this out, people were generating any kind of packet they wanted out of their badge. Uh, and including the god mode stuff which was letting people walk around and just nuke entire rooms and turn them into any kind of thing they want, even make them all dead, which was a lot of fun for everybody. So that was definitely the grand prize for the badge hacking that was going on. So we learned a lot of things from this here. Um, one thing we learned is when you're playing around with something, especially something small scale like this in a confined area with people who know what they're doing, you really have to prepare for denial of service attacks. Uh, they they really ruined us for the game. It essentially, every time that one guy would walk into the room, when one guy knew who was doing it, walked into the room, the room pretty much shut down. The game wasn't in action for a bit. If, uh, actually, I think I lost a slide here, but we go back to this. So the big spikes we have here, uh, the ones where all the colors are going up the same, that was when this one guy would walk into a room with his badge that was constantly fuzzing. Um, because of that, when everything shut down, things were just going nuts, and you could tell when he went to, like, went out for the night to check out Providence uh, when he came back to the hotel around midnight. Um, so this guy was a walking denial of service attack. So that really sucked. We got to make sure we do something about that next year. Uh, the one thing we really need to do is put checksums on the packets. Maybe we were using a lot of just really fake packets. There weren't really valid Zigbee packets or anything at all, but it was really just what we got to work in the three weeks we worked on it. Um, it would be a little nicer if we made something so it check for a valid packet, make sure replay attacks don't work, and make sure fuzzing doesn't work in the future. But it's nice, it's kind of fun to track people at the same time, so that worked out pretty cool. Uh, sorry about that. Um, the one thing that was cool about XOR encryption was it was almost good enough for the conference. We wanted to last about 24 hours from when the first badges went out. So people would have to work on it off and on for a day, and then actually have something that they could play with. Uh, based on the data we saw, people started really doing strange things and really started doing what looked like brute force attacks after about 18 hours. So I don't know, I guess that's if you take a sample of 250 people, someone will crack XOR encryption in 18 hours. So I wouldn't quote me on that metric, but I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and one thing we need to do definitely next year is incorporate more hardware hacks into the game. Uh, this was probably one of the more complicated parts of it. Shutting down the 555 timer attack approach was really unfortunate, especially since somebody tried it and because only one person tried it. Um, where it would be nice to have some way to influence it that way. That's definitely something we thought would make the game a lot better for next year and really improve upon things quite a bit. So, but at the same time, people, a lot of people had fun with the hardware. It's a really fun platform to work with, really easy to, uh, add things onto. Um, it has a lot of extra GPIO pins so you can just start putting things on it like you would in anything else. Uh, really fun. I would really recommend checking out this uh, whole hardware platform and doing what you can. So I have a little conclusion here, but not the finale so to speak. Um, in the end, the humans did win, mostly because the zombies couldn't do anything about it. Um, so that was 
unfortunate, but that was the reality of what we saw. And we love it just the same because people had a lot more fun with it that way. Having Zigbee involved in badges like this is a whole lot of fun. If anybody's trying to come up with an idea for their own conference, their own whatever function, they to have some sort of ID, I'd really advise checking it out. This chip here is in about the $15 range for, uh, uh, for the chip itself. So you might be able to whip up something pretty low price using, like, we don't have anything, anything really fancy here, an integrated antenna onto the board and a few other components. So you could probably do this even cheaper if you really tried. Um, but it was a whole lot of fun. And people really, really love messing with their fellow attendees. They love making uh, problems for other people. Watching people actually just saying I'm attacking just so I can attack you was a lot of fun. And people really got a kick out of the badges. They're, they're really functional. They really worked out well. And uh, we were happy that we had something that people have gone on to use after the conference. So that was pretty great. Um, this picture pretty much sums up how it all went for us, if you can read it. We set up a cardboard box near the exit saying uh, recycle your badge here. And all we got was a napkin that said, sorry, way too cool. So that was a nice validation that everything went well at the end of the day. And unfortunately, we didn't get any badges back. So, <laughs> so I have a bit of a spoiler here that we're going to be doing this again next year in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, the end of April. Uh, and then April 29th through May 1st at the same place as last year, the Hotel Providence, which was very gracious to us. And uh, we're trying to come up with a badge design for next year now. We want to, definitely want to do it earlier to give ourselves more than three weeks to code the thing. Um, but we're thinking about going to this chip here, the AT Mega 128 RFA1, which is uh, based on the Arduino uh, platform. Uh, one thing we found from doing this contest was when people were trying to do the badge hacking, most more people had uh, had experience with the Arduino than they did with like GCC or any other processors out there. So we want to enable that and let people help figure that out and start being able to do things while they're just at the con attending and having fun. Uh, the picture you have there is from a uh, that's from the Dresden Electronic uh, Company in Germany. I forget the exact model number of that chip there, but that's, they sell that as about 21 euros right now. I think for the price of it, so it's about 20 to 25 bucks, I guess, US. Um, but it's pretty cheap. The chip itself, just for the 18 mega chip, is actually much cheaper. So hopefully we'll be able to do this better and cheaper next year. But just like uh, we have with the chip this year, it has an embedded uh, Zigbee uh, components in it. Um, we might try to do an LCD, but I think the Ninja Networks guys beat us to that this year. So that's unfortunate. Um, but anyways, this is also subject to change. So if we find that this is a bit out of our range or things get a little crazy, we'll probably just go with the same thing we had this year and do something similar. Um, but we hope to see everybody there. It's going to be a really great time, and uh, it'll be really fun. So that's about all I had. Some some special thanks. I want to thank uh, John Duxta for being the guy who took care of everything last year, wrangling together. Dragorn for his addition with Kismet, where if you get your hands on either one of these badges or the uh, Red Bee Econo tag, it's a really great enhancement, especially if you're doing anything involving Zigbee at all. Um, it's now in SVN, so go check it out. Uh, the Redware guys were excellent working with us, helping us out, getting the entire badge design. Essentially, people have play testing like me and the con attendees, which really made this into a fun experiment for us to figure out what was going on, see what the kind of attacks people would do, and go on from there. And we had a lot of fun doing it. Everybody seemed to have a good time. So I'll take some Q and A now. Um, I have a few. I'm a little early here. I, the demo didn't go exactly as planned. But uh, if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. Yes, over there. How many, how many badges did we end up making was the question. We made about 250. Uh, I think it was exactly 250. Uh, we got them all produced locally in uh, Foxborough, Massachusetts, uh, which worked out great for us. They cut us a nice deal for helping them, letting, us letting themselves advertise during the con. Um, we were happy to go with the local provider, too. Um, when we did the initial batch, we received about 25% of them were broken or had some sort of flaw with them. Uh, about a week before the con. So that made things really uh, hairy towards the end there. We had a lot of emergency soldering and emergency uh, shipping and stuff to do, which was a lot of fun. But in the end, it all worked out pretty well. So we had enough for everybody. Any other questions? OK, I think that's it. Thank you. Oh, oh one back there, actually. Oh, thanks. We have plenty of time, so I'll be, yeah, come on up and yell it. It'll, be, it'll work better. No, thank you. I'm sorry? And actually, we don't. We, uh, we had very few coming here, and we saved them for the demo. So it uh, was very, uh, very tight at the end. Everybody kept theirs. Nobody wanted to share theirs after the fact. But I think that's it. OK, thank you.